Hello, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war related topics. Uh, today, I am so excited to talk to Carolyn Woods Eisenberg about her new book, uh, Fire and Rain Nixon, Kissinger, and the Wars in Southeast Asia. Um, professor Eisenberg is a uh, professor of U.S. history and American foreign relations at Hofstra University. She has won numerous awards for her work, like the Stuart Burneth Book Prize for the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, the Herbert Hoover Book Prize, and she was a finalist for the Lionel Herber Book Prize. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times and on NPR. Uh, Carolyn, how are you today? I'm just fine. Wonderful. Starting the morning with war. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Well, uh, I'm really excited to to talk to you about your book. Um, first of all, I love books that take many years to write. Uh, there's something about them that that just feels very special. Um, mm -hmm. On my, the first episode I had for this podcast, I had a historian. His name's uh, Professor Philip Blood, and um, he's he's been he's he's been a professor for he's been in the field for a long time now. And I was like, so when did you first get interested in this book? And he's like, well, this goes all the way back to my PhD dissertation. Uh, so I, I definitely enjoy those those projects that are, are multi-year. You write at the beginning of this book that you thought this was just going to be like a brief uh, uh, overview of, of, or not overview, but a, a brief work on Vietnam during the Nixon years. Um, that obviously wasn't the case. How long did it take for you to write this book, and, and why did it take longer than you anticipated? Well, a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, I, I think it's more accurate to say that I've been writing this book for a slightly more than 20 years, so there is that. Nice. Um, but actually, I mean, I think two different things are, are pertinent. One is that writing this book was not the only thing I was doing in all these you know, in all of this time, um, I, I still think my primary responsibility is um, to my classroom, to my students, to my job. And actually, I think one of the things that's happening now, which is very unfortunate in academia, is that for younger people, the pressure to write something that could be peer reviewed is so intense and so crazy that it actually makes it very difficult for a new young professor to really focus on teaching. So I had the particular advantage that I think I was already tenured and a full professor when I uh, got interested. So, I mean, in terms of why it took a long time, I, I think all of these things, uh, my, my children, my grandchildren, my classroom, my peace group, and this. You, you, so um, you write about that, how this this spans to your grandchildren. Uh, yeah, I know your, it really does. You know, once before some of them were even born. Um, so that's one factor. Then there actually is a second thing that's pretty pertinent, which is that is the level of declassification of not of documents from the Nixon administration. You know, when I started out, there you know there were declassified documents, but. I hadn't really even imagined the extent of what this would become over the next 20 years. And I don't think we're ever going to have actually anything like the documentation that we have for, for Nixon. So just as one illustration, the tapes, for example, most Americans think, well, the tapes, what, what, didn't that wasn't that old? But actually not. What people are remembering are the tapes that had to do with Watergate, which the court insisted be open but the tapes about everything else were remain classified so those started opening up um you know while i was already in my project and initially i had to go to the archives and put headphones on and listen so i mean that's one example or a second example of what's unusual is that um, henry kissinger had all of his phone calls monitored so he had what's called telcons, which, uh, which like are thousands of them. The guy was always on the phone. It's unbelievable. Um, so there's lots of that. He tried to claim that as his personal property, which he would control. Um, but again, I think legal action was started. And in the end, he was probably advised that he, that claim wouldn't stand up. So just those two sources alone were are like amazing sources, but lots of other things that were not known really 
opened up. So I would say that's really the second thing. And and actually, just real quick to add to that, um, one of the things that also really opened up were the transcripts of Kissinger's negotiations with the Russians and the Chinese. And not only were there transcripts from the U.S. side, but unexpectedly, the Russian documents became available after the Cold War ended. So you could actually compare what Ambassador Debrinin was was saying to his folks back in Moscow about a meeting and what Kissinger said about a meeting. So, I mean, that's just an example of the, you know, incredible material. So that, that is really the other explanation. So why did these materials, why did they um, become declassified only recently? Well, it's not so real. I mean, some of these things, again, remembering how slow I am in writing this book, <laughs> um, the, you know, some of this became available 10 or 15 years ago. But gotcha. just is that just a standard? Is that just um, a standard process to wait? Yeah, for... I, well, it is. And then, you know, you also had people, um, including myself, you know, um, uh, submitting FOIA, you know, applications to make certain things available that might not have been. So it's really, you know, been a landslide. I mean, who in the world would have expected, for example, that the Russian documents would come out? And actually the State Department, um, in one of their volumes, did something very unusual because they had the Russian documents, is that they did an vo entire volume on U.S.-Soviet uh, negotiations, a huge volume. And in that volume, they had the Nick. Kissinger's conversations with the Russians, but also they included transla they translated the Russian documents as well. So at some point, I asked the State Department historian, "Well, because okay, they're different, you know, like what, what De Brienne says, they talked about what Kissinger says does not always square." And I remember asking the State Department person who worked on this, "Well, who do you trust? Which document?" I think his feeling was like mine, which is that on the whole, that De Brienne's account was actually more believable than than Kissinger. But I mean, that's an example of the kind of thing, and it took forever to read these things. So, you know, in some ways you could think of it as I only took a short amount of time to write this book. <laughs> from a certain we'll take point. we'll take that interpretation. Uh, <laughs> Well, you, you talk about how, um, so you hope that this, this project um, is, is helpful for a, a new generation of readers. Um, and I really love that. Uh, so I'm, I'm 30. I'm 30 years old. And, yeah, and on, <laughs> well, you know, honestly, uh, I didn't know much about the Vietnam War. I knew the, very, I knew the basic things. Mm -hmm. I knew the rough time frame. I knew there was a draft. Mm -hmm. um, I knew there was a peace movement and, and that the war was unpopular. Um, and I knew it, of course, it took place in Vietnam, but that's not even really the, the full story because you write a lot about Laos and Cambodia uh, as well. Why do you think that, that Vietnam either has started to, to fade or is fading from, from the American memory? Well, I mean, there's not a single answer to that question. You know, when I first um, started teaching about the war, well, actually, take, scratch what I was about to say. When I first started teaching about the war, the war was still going on. Uh, so that was, that was not a problem. I was teaching at Dartmouth College, and that kind of coincided with, uh, so we're talking now 1972, when Nixon uh, responded to a North Vietnamese offensive by bombing North Vietnamese cities. Um, and so that was happening while I taught my class. Um, and actually, you know, in the middle of that, I mean, so remember when the kids were all interested, I mean, there was no question about that. Um, and we had um, at Dartmouth, we had like a demonstration outside where the draft bus was in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And then we, several faculty members actually and staff did a sit in, we tried to block this bus. And uh, the bus, by the way, was not really a bus because this is New Hampshire. So it was actually Omar's taxi. Um, is what it really was. But in any event, we did this action and we had like, I, don't, I feel like there were like a thousand students that were, we didn't want students to get arrested. So it was all people who, you know, were, uh, you know, were adult at that point. Like students were adult, but different level. 
Um, so that happened, you know, where, I mean, that was needless to say, you know, caught the eye of students, right? If they're having, you know, professors actually get arrested. Um, so that was like a very different situation. And the war, you know, if there were conservative students as well as liberal students, conservative students were mad that the professors had done this. Point being that nobody thought this was like uninteresting or unimportant. And, you know, one of the things that I would really emphasize about this, which um, is on my mind, because we just did a book launch for um, for the gathering people together. And, and one of the things about the book launch was that for the guests at the launch who were mostly my age, um, for us, Vietnam was an intensely personal situ you know, phenomenon. It wasn't just like some current event that nobody's paying attention to. Like, you know, my students aren't following Ukraine, for example. Right? But for people of my age, and, you know, certainly if you were in college, this was really a riveting situation. Um, and the draft was part of that, right? I mean, young men had student deferments if they were full-time in college, but um, they knew they were going to lose those deferments. So, so, I mean, that's one piece that, you know, you just couldn't ignore this going on. It also, you know, as more and more became known about the war, it raised a lot of serious moral questions, right, for all of us. Like, what is your responsibility as a person living in a country that has essentially invaded another three countries? <laughs> you know, we talk about Putin um, as if nobody ever invaded anything before. It's like, you know, I'm forced amnesia. So what I'm saying is, you know, the, our feeling was the U.S. had sent troops to somebody else's country. They're killing people, ruining the land, and we're sitting back. And what, what are we supposed to do about it? So that was very immediate. And I won't go through all the sort of iterations after that, except to say that, for example, when I was teaching in Hofstra and the, you know, several decades ago, and I would ask my students, like, why are you in this class? Um, a common answer was because my father was there and he would talk to me about it. And I'm thinking if I take this class, maybe it can open up communication. So that was you know, not an unusual response. And in one case, we actually had some vets come in, I remember. So every generation, it's been different. No, that's, I mean, that, but that is really, that is interesting that how these, how different generations view uh, Vietnam. Um, and so, so you, you mentioned the draft, for example. So, and you write about this actually at a point. Um, so I grew up in a, a, a small rural town in Northern Indiana. And the draft loomed so large uh, uh, in in our town. Um, there there are memorials everywhere. Uh, well, not everywhere, but there are some memorials. You know, such and such died at at Quezon, You know, never forget that that type of thing. Um, a lot of my grandpa's friends died in Vietnam. My dad's neighbor died in a helicopter crash in Vietnam. My wrestling coach he was drafted and and went to 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 Vietnam. And the draft was such a frightening thing for me growing up um, because in, in our community, it was a scary thing. Um, and you write a little bit about in small towns, working class towns. Hill, Ohio, actually. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about that. Why, is, why, why did this affect, why did the draft affect small towns, rural working class towns more than, than other areas? Because uh, um, I think the short answer to this, which might not be complete, is that a large number if, if for working class towns um there were a large number of young people that were not in college and so they didn't have a deferment and you know and maybe at the beginning they also some of those young men were were you know felt the war was important and a, you know something you should do they people had been in world war ii people had been in korea this is your responsibility. So some of that, but I, I think probably the major thing is really the num the proportion of, of young people that were not in college and they were not shielded, um, right? And I have a section of my book. I'm not looking at it right now, but it was a section about I think Bealesville, Ohio, where the mayor, you know, wrote to the Defense Department saying, you know, could you please, you know, we already have you know X amount of deaths. We still have three more kids over there. Could you spare our town? And 
the answer to that was no, except, I mean, what's also relevant is that in the Nixon years, uh, certainly the first term, the war is continuing, but with a gigantic but, which is unlike Johnson, who was basically adding troops from um, 1963, maybe there were like maybe 16,000 U.S. troops. And by the end of Johnson's term, there were 550,000 in Vietnam. Well, Nixon was doing the opposite, which is that he was taking troops out from the very beginning, you know, 30,000, a couple months go by, another 40,000, another 60,000. So that reality also begins to really dawn on people. <laughs> At a certain point, I actually think the people that it dawned on the least, I have to say, were people in the anti-war movement. I mean, you know, one of the revelations when I was doing my research, it's kind of interesting to do research on something that you lived through and you saw things a certain way, and then you look back and it's a little different. And so one of the things that I hadn't really appreciated at the time, nor did anyone else, is that by the time that Nixon is actually up for re-election in 72, all the combat troops had been removed from Vietnam. You know, there were, and that, there were, there were a couple, you know, maybe there was 20,000 left. They were mostly, you know, in support, training. Um, maybe there were, him, you know, a small number of combat troops. But basically, all the combat troops had really been removed. And, you know, to a large extent, I mean, this is a different discussion. I actually think part of why that happened was because the anti-war movement was an effort to really, you know, shut that down. But weirdly, people in the anti-war movement didn't really get the fact that all these troops had come home. But, you know, and, and, and one other sort of interesting thing to look back at is that when right around the time that Nixon got reelected, there were various polls that were taken before asking people, did they trust George McGovern or Nixon to get us out of the war. And overwhelmingly, people said Nixon. And I remember thinking at the time, as you know, people are really stupid. How could they think that? But actually, that wasn't true. The people were smart because they could see in their towns, kids are coming home on a vast scale, 550,000 troops. So you're down to 20,000. So that's actually a huge thing. But it's something that depending on where you lived as as you know, in Indiana, which had your town, which you know suffered casualties and so forth, when troops came home, it was going to weigh very differently than, let's say, for students. So, yeah, um, well, I mean, that's a whole topic in itself. Well, let's uh, let's let's get into some of the history um, uh, for the war then. Um, so your your book is obviously about the war during the Nixon years, um, but I was I was surprised to to learn that. Actually, the Vietnam War really started uh, uh, during the the Truman administration, or at least the buildup <laughs> then started during the Truman administration. Um, walk us walk us through the buildup from from Truman uh, going up to Nixon. Well, um, at the end, in, I'm, I'm trying to think where could you start this story. Um, uh, going into the 20th century, France, you know, had control Vietnam as a, all of Indochina, not just Vietnam, but what would become Laos and Cambodia, was a colony of France. And there was an independence movement that was growing inside Vietnam, um, which is known as the Viet Minh. Um, and that movement was led by Ho Chi Minh, a more familiar name. And the, the distinctive thing about Ho Chi Minh was that, I mean, actually, there are three things. One is that he was very smart. And the other is that he was an intense nationalist, that, you know, the belief in, in Vietnam's autonomy, you know, and should be in sovereignty, was very important to him. But he also was a communist um, as well. Now, that wasn't always true. And, you know, one of the other things, if you want to go back to Woodrow Wilson, um, is that at the peace talks in 1919, where they had been so much talk by, by Wilson of we, we want to make the world safe for democracy and the, that should be the outgrowth of the war. So um, Ho Chi Minh actually goes to Paris 
um, thinking that the Americans will be really excited to meet him. And there, of course, that doesn't really happen. So that's a very significant sign to him. Uh, and then you have the other side of it, which is that after 1919, Lenin is very, and the Russians are very interested in, in decolonization. And I believe that, you know, that that's an important area of struggle. So I so, read you know, that Ho Chi Minh actually, he, he asked the, I don't know if asked for help, but he was more inclined first to seek help from the Americans before, before the Soviet Union. I forget where well, I read that. I read that a long time well, ago. Well, it's true, but it, you have to then pass through very quickly, you know, several decades. So France is in control of Vietnam um, throughout the first part of the 20th century. Um, so there's this struggle going on, but um, it's in, it's just not really decisive. And then when Second World War breaks out, there's a point at which Japan drives the French out of Indochina. And oddly, that's what you're remembering, which is that at least for a year, what happens is that with France in control, so the Viet Minh is not going to turn its attention to the Japanese occupation. And for that reason, there's a connection that's made between members of the Viet Minh and Americans um, who are parachuted into the area who are also fighting Japan. So that's where the connection is. And there are personal relationships, Ameri you know, that get established right back, you know, then that would put you in 1944. Um, and so partly because of those relationships, uh, Ho Chi Minh is, is optimistic that the Americans are going to be his friends um, after the war, which turns out not to be true. But, you know, ironically, he, he proclaims independence, right, at the end of the war and uses the Declaration of Independence as his, as his inspiration and so forth. But unfortunately, Truman uh, and the Truman administration decide to support France rather than the Viet Minh. Uh, by the time you're into maybe 1953, the United States is paying for about 80% of the war effort, giving advisors, et cetera. So then what happens is you have the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Uh, the French army is surrounded by Viet Minh. They're defeated. You get a conference then in Geneva to how is this all going to be settled now that the French have taken this, um, you know, this defeat. Ho Chi Minh goes to that conference pretty sure that this is going to be it. They're going to get independence and be a united country. The United States doesn't government. Now we're talking about the Eisenhower administration. We're talking about John Foster Dulles do not want to see that happen. So in the end, what occurs is that um, there's a decision made to temporarily partition Vietnam, North and South. Uh, Ho, the Viet Minh under Ho Chi Minh are, are essentially given control of the Northern part. Uh, technically the French are going to still have control in the South. Uh, and the idea is that after two years, there's going to be a election and the country would be unified. So that was the deal. Um, a lot of the people from the Viet Minh felt really betrayed by that. And all the while, too, uh, the, the fear of communism is really growing. This is the 1950s. Right. Uh, so the fear of communism is, is becoming front and center domestically. Well, that, that's true. And... Um, also, you know, very little interest by people in power about, you know, what what's really happening in Vietnam or what people who live in Vietnam or, you know, what do they care about? What are their commitments? This is sort of irrelevant to everybody. Um, so, of course, LBJ chose not to run uh, again for for another term in office. Um, and you write that that was actually that was partially influenced by what was going on in, in Vietnam, right? Oh, it's totally influenced by what was going on in Vietnam. I mean, the but so I mean, then you have a situation where, for this period of four years, from you know, at, well, it's it's even more kept from the time Kennedy is assassinated, uh, in November of '63, going right up to the early months of '68. You know, what you've got is this escalation, um, is happening. There's more and more violence in in Vietnam. More Americans are being killed. This is major fact, right? Thousands of Americans are dying over there. Um, more and more money is being spent on the war, diverted from you know domestic purposes. So all these things are happening, but they're all happening in a context where 
the president and various spokespeople are continuing to tell everybody that, yes, but we're turning the corner, there's light at the end of the tunnel, we're really winning, and so forth. But then what happens is that early in 1968, you get the Tet Offensive. And the Tet Offensive is that all of a sudden, during the holiday of Tet, there are uprisings um, by the Viet. It's now really the National Liberation Front, which is the descendant of the Viet Minh. The uprisings all across South Vietnam, every single major city, every provincial capital um, is hit um, by NLF insurgents. And it's, even though, in fact, in the end, the, um, all those all of those uh, uprisings are ultimately put down by by Americans, South Vietnamese as well. Um, the fact that the enemy was so strong that they could actually have these uprisings all across the South really belied the fact or belied the claim of, oh, everything's ending and we're at the light of the end of the tunnel and so forth. You would just, you know, and some of these uprisings were very dramatic. For example, um, Viet Cong insurgent, that's an American term, but most of your listeners will recognize it. Um, you know, Viet Cong are able to get into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, right? That 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 that's possible. You know, even though there's you know maximum security around the embassy. Now, again, ultimately, you know, they're killed, and that you know, they, so the the occupation of the embassy ends. But it's pretty dramatic that after all these years, and by this point, you've got maybe thirty five thousand Americans who've died already. And they're getting into the embassy and they're having these uprisings. And in Hue, for example, they, you know, this uprising, you know, hangs on for another three months. So all of this makes the Johnson people, but especially Johnson himself, look like complete incompetent and liars. Right. And so that opens up uh, the, the real possibility that he's going to lose the election. Right. Well, I mean, that's what's that's what's yeah. happening. Well, so then now we've we've arrived at uh, we've arrived at Nixon. Uh, so so talk then about <laughs> talk then about about Nixon. How did he feel about Vietnam initially? Because he he is he was known as being kind of a uh, a hardliner against communism um, before before 1968. How did he feel about Vietnam initially, and then how did that change once he got into office? Well, I I think I mean right in in you know if you look at the period where he was, um, you know, in Congress um, and the period where he's vice president of the United States, you know, he's, he's, he's a super hawk. Um, and of course he's famous for that, you know, because of his role in uh, prosecuting, in, in, in investigating Alger Hess and discrediting Alger Hess. So he's, this is his reputation. Um, and for most of his, you know, time politics that, you know, he's, he states, you know, kind of the, you know, Cold War orthodoxy that you're supposed to say about him. Um, however, by the time that he's running in 68, and remembering now Ted has happened, um, you know, you'd had the candidacies of Robert Kennedy and Eugene McCarthy, I mean, that's its own story. He knows that the Vietnam War is very unpopular. So, for example, there's not going to be any support for expanding the U.S. military involvement, even though you've just now seen how strong the enemy is. So he's not going to talk that language. His way of, of positioning himself is to say that he has a secret plan for peace in Vietnam, and he's not going to disclose it for various patriotic reasons. He's not going to disclose it. Um, I, I mean, I think when you look at the record, he didn't disclose it because he didn't actually have a plan. But another point is, yeah, he's I not think you say in the stuff. in the election, he, he when he was asked, he would go, "Well, you know, I don't. There's there's a peace process going on right now, so I don't I don't want to say what that that plan is." I thought that was really interesting. Right. I mean, so he's manages to be evasive, um, you know, the whole time, and then there's this sort of scandal that comes, you know, has been opened up more recently, not then, about the fact that when you're nearing um, election day in 64, um, the, the Johnson administration 
um, has been trying to get negotiations going uh, with North Vietnam, with South Vietnam, with all the principles. They want to get that launched. And they seem, and, but there's certain impediments um, to getting it launched. But, you know, around about October, it does look like um, they, that negotiation, there's enough procedural stuff that's been cleared up that the negotiations could start. And what we now know from the record is that uh, the, the Nixon people spoke to um, people associated with the South Vietnamese government and encouraged them to sabotage this effort um, until past election day by assuring them that they're going to get a better deal from Nixon than they're going to get from Lyndon Johnson. So let's let's t- you know turn over the apple cart there. And, you know, that was certainly not known at the time by people. Apparently, Lena Johnson knew that's what was happening. Um, but, you know, it shows it shows really the cynicism and opportunism, um, you know, of Nixon that you would actually, um, you know, undermine peace talks. Now, sometimes yeah. that's been exaggerated by, by scholars, recent scholars, because it makes it seem like our best chance to save American lives – got upturned. That's not really true. They were very far away um, from, I mean, even if you got the deal about who's going to sit where at the table and, you know, what the terms of discussion would be, that didn't mean that you were going to have peace right away. I mean, it was going to be a very big problem, but it definitely is revealing of the Nixon approach that he would engage in that kind of sabotage as people would do it. Well, let's talk uh, also a little bit about Kissinger then, uh, another big figure uh, in the book. Um, what about him? What, how did he feel? Um, you know, I get the sense Nixon was a little bit more practical in his approach to Vietnam for how uh, how it could benefit him in in his political career. Talk about Kissinger. Was he maybe more ideological? How how did his feelings? I don't know. I would change? say the the most relevant fact about Kissinger is that his priority was Kissinger. I mean, right? He he wants to be influential. Um, you know, he like Nixon had been a Cold War hawk, really, and somebody who, for example, thought that people ought to, you know, focus on the possible uses of nuclear weapons. You know, not that would. You know, some that we could fight a nuclear war with certain nuclear weapons, and that, that's something that you know policymakers you know could be thinking about of uses of nuclear um, of a nuclear threat. So he's coming into this position, you know, with good credentials as a, as a hawk and even somebody who is especially hawkish, you know, given his ideas and focus on nuclear stuff. So that's kind of who he is, and he's you know he's obviously picked for that. Um, I mean, one of the sort of side stories about Kissinger is that he had been a consultant to the Johnson administration. And what <clears throat> some, I haven't found this my, to my own research, but other historians have pointed out that because he's in touch with the Johnson people um, about the talks in Paris, he then tips off the Nixon campaign and tells them when they get to the point they're just about to have the, you know, an agreement about moving forward. Um, he lets the the um, uh, the Nixon people know that so that they have the heads up and proceed to sabotage things. So, you know, he's establishing a connection to them, you know, in that difficult part. I think in um, recruiting Dr. Kissinger, I think, um, you know, that Nixon wanted somebody who would be very smart. He also wanted somebody that would be very tough. Um it surprised a lot of people because in general, Nixon was not known to love intellectuals of any sort. So now he's going to bring in this guy from Harvard. Um, but, you know, it's assumed that he would be hawkish. And I think it's very hard to fully characterize um, Kissinger's approach because um, it really evolves over time. <clears throat> Both he and we somehow think that once they're in charge, that they're going to be able to wrap this thing up. Now, why they exactly thought that is a question. Um, but they did have that expectation, and it would be some amount of negotiating and some amount of escalating and, you know, all these pieces, and then they would be very smart, and they would be able to get a deal. Um, and I would say that, you know, once sort of in place, uh, Kissinger wants to get a deal. 
for uh, for the Vietnam problem. He definitely wants to, and he wants to be the person that makes it. The, the, the wrinkle in that is that the kind of deal they wanted at the beginning was a deal in which um, there would be mutual withdrawal. So the U.S. would take its troops out, but so would North Vietnam. They'd take their troops out. And also another piece in the American position was that when we left, that the government, that the South Vietnamese government under Chu would be in place, right? That, that that's okay. So that's what they think they're going to get Hanoi to agree to a peace agreement, a ceasefire and so forth, but a peace agreement with mutual withdrawal and government of South Vietnam stays in place. Now, how are they going to get that? Right. I mean, to some extent you say, well, you know, Johnson couldn't get it. He didn't, but, you know, I think, that in their minds, they're, they, they see themselves as such geniuses that they're going to be able to do what Lyndon Johnson couldn't do, which is, again, to keep the focus on getting a positive settlement. Associated with that was some willingness to escalate the war in certain respects um, that hadn't been done before. So the, the earliest example of the decision to bomb Cambodia right, secretly. I mean, Americans didn't know they were doing it. But that was a significant escalation on the U.S. part. And they're like thinking not only that it will be good because you'll kill a lot of North Vietnamese who are over the border, so that's good. Um, But also it has the additional good, which is that um, um, you actually will, um, you know, show the, show Hanoi that you're really tough, that you're serious, you're determined. And therefore, that Hanoi is going to realize, oh, now we're really dealing with tough guys. We're going to make a deal. So that's what they expect. They're wrong, right? What, is- what What were some of the more interesting things in, in your your research for the for this book? What were some of the more interesting things that you found and, and that you learned and that you thought were really fascinating? Well, I would say there are, I would say three things actually. Maybe if you have another two hours, I'll say four. Yeah. Um, but. <laughs> First of all, I mean, one thing that just surprised me is like I was not a person that admired and loved Richard Nixon before I was writing this book. So, you know, and or Kissinger. But I actually at times was absolutely shocked <laughs> by, by how indifferent they were to even our own people dying. Like they just, you know, or the, the deaths of civilians, you know, periodically it come up in some discussion of, oh, yeah, but if we do that, a lot of American pilots will be shot down or a lot of civilians will be killed or, you know, and this is like a matter of complete indifference to them. I mean, they'll say some obligatory things, oh, let's not kill civilians, but then they give orders which are going to kill civilians. So honestly, even though I didn't think it, my attitude could get worse, it really was like, oh, my God, like they don't care about anything um so that's like one one piece of it was really surprised um a second surprise was about the very important role of melvin laird secretary of defense now at that time you know and i again i was part of the it's a you know college graduate school professor this is all anti-war land um and and melvin laird was of little interest and didn't see him as any different from anybody else. But he was very, very important Um, and significant because Melvin Laird is coming to his job as a politician. He's not from these national security bureaucracies. He's a congressman from Wisconsin, um, pretty conservative Republican, um, and is extremely skillful in maneuvering on the congressional side, which is why Nixon takes him because Nixon knows he's going to have to deal with Congress and he thinks Mel Laird is going to be really effective in that way. Surprise is, as far as I could tell from reading the record, and I also interviewed Laird um, in two two phone calls, the surprise was that Melvin Laird actually was, his main concern was just to get the troops out. That's what he cared about, getting the troops home as fast as possible. And I, you know, I always sort of think of him as Schindler, if you're familiar with Schindler's List, the guy who, you know, engaged in a lot of negative things in order to save the lives of lots of other people. I feel like Laird is like that, that, you know, he basically, he will do what Richard Nixon wants him to do in Congress, whatever he personally thinks. Like he didn't think bombing 
Cambodia was wise. He didn't think invading Cambodia was wise. I mean, the list of things he didn't think was wise goes on and on. But publicly, he always defended the administration. But every time he defended it, he would remind Nixon, remember, 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 we were going to take 30,000 troops out of November. So let's, let's keep that in mind. And then in February, we were going to take out, you know, this many people. Um, and so he's constantly trading his providing Nixon with cover for troop removals. Kissinger is absolutely opposed to troop removals. To him, that's stupid. If you want to get a deal with North Vietnam, <clears throat> aren't they going to be able to see that the U.S. is taking its troops out? So why? what's the incentive? And he says that right from the very beginning of, say, by September of 69, he, st- he feels it the whole time. But that's a one area where Kissinger loses um, out. And the reason he loses on this issue is that Richard Nixon is a politician. And Richard Nixon knows that he has to maintain his uh, identity or reputation as a man of peace if he wants to be have a second term in office. So in some ways, what I actually think is that uh, Nick, is that Melvin Laird's pressure and Nixon's listening to that about troops is really because of the peace movement, the anti-war movement, is that that's the pressure that's existing inside the country. If you get more and more young Americans home Americans are going to tolerate a lot of other things, like maybe they don't care about Cambodia, maybe they don't care about Laos, you know, and so forth. But this is a political move. So, you know, that's for Kissinger is of ongoing frustration. But he, for him, the most important things are, first of all, he wants to be more important than Secretary of State Rogers. Like, that's a constant obsession of his. Like, who is Nixon really listening to? So that's you know, of great concern. He wants to have influence. Um, he His reputation, of course, soars with, you know, the opening to China and then his, you know, diplomacy with Russia and so forth. Um, but, you know, I would say in general, if you're thinking about the whole period, that really, um, that Kissinger really was an advocate down the line for t- more militaristic policies, even than Richard Nixon. Um, he does, he hides that, you know, because he's also by 1971, 72, he's become a celebrity, you know, he's hanging out with movie stars, he's, you know, important intellectuals and blah, blah. And it always conveys to these people that he's like this great humanitarian, you know, dove secretly, and it's just Nixon. Like, that's just fake. I mean, he, he is, if anything, if there's any consistency, it's to do something that would cause more death and destruction. <laughs> I don't, I couldn't find almost any place where he'd say, well, oh, let's not do that because some people would be dying. It's like not in his land. So anyway, that was two. The third surprise really was reading these transcripts of, um, again, mostly Kissinger, but also Nixon's negotiations with the Russians and the Chinese. I mean, that was really stunning to read. And why is it? Because you know, they're still maintaining this fiction about why we're in Vietnam to, so that, you know, China and Russia won't take over the world, right? That's, you know, people in Indiana think that's what this is about. That's why their sons are, you know, sacrificing over there. It's because of that. Meanwhile, when you actually read their conversations with the Russians and the Chinese, they, you know, like butter wouldn't melt in their mouths. They are not only rhetorically nice, they are offering various concessions because um, they're not tough at all. Um, in those negotiations. If anything that different, they're making concessions. Why? Because number one, um, these visits by Nixon in 72 is like politically great for him. Again, he's a peacemaker, not a warmonger. So there's that. Also because they, you know, think that the Russians and the Chinese, as they improve relations, are really going to lean on the North Vietnamese to accept the deal that the U.S. wants. So, you know, it's, it's, it's that that's happening. But I, I just have to say the tenor of those discussions were so surprising to me and also infuriating, right? Again, you've got this whole country that's sacrificing. And, you, you know, meanwhile, you know, you're having toasts in Moscow and you're, you know, going to Leningrad memorials and, and so forth. So that's it. Yeah. I got it to three. And you're, well, I, I'm very impressed. Uh, and that's really your, one of your main arguments of your book is that, 
um, in order to to overshadow the failures of their policies, um, Nixon, the Nixon administration was willing to make all sorts of concessions to the Soviet Union and, and to the Chinese, which struck me because going if you go back to Nixon, you know the Nixon of the 1950s, it's like a sworn enemy, uh, the Soviet Union, and I thought that was so surprising and, and fascinating. And I, I was so glad that you, uh, that you wrote about that. I mean, there's actually this one episode and I, you know, I, you'll be amazed to learn that I haven't reread my book recently, but <laughs> so I don't have it. I no longer remember it exactly, but you know, there's like one moment um, where or I feel like it might've been, it was maybe the summer of seven, probably summer of 71. Right. So here, you know, the war is still going on. The U.S. is bombing like crazy. Uh, Cambodia is coming apart. Et cetera. So uh, the Brennan is going has to be on the west coast of Florida to uh, of, I'm sorry, the west coast of California, California to confer with people at the consulate. So he's going to go to California. And Nixon, this says he's Nixon is, you know, in San Clemente at this particular time. And the you know, uh, Kissinger tells him that the Breen is going to California. And so Nixon says, you know, really, the Russians are really people. We always have to remember that. Why don't we invite the Breen and his wife to come stay at San Clemente? And, you know, Pat really likes Mrs. De Breen. so that would be really nice. And so we'll invite him, which is a nice, so the Breen, you know, comes and visits with the Nixons. And then Kissinger plans this exciting thing where he's going to take De Breen to Disneyland for the day and also to one of the major studios and he's going to arrange for the Brennan to meet Alfred Hitchcock and maybe Frank Sinatra. He's going to create like a whole thing for the Brennan. Um, and also in that trip, I think the Brennan writes about this actually in his memoir, you know, on that same, you know, little visit to Los Angeles and all the celebrities, um, he and the Brennan go to a beach they go swimming. I think it's the Brennan who comments that there's only like one uh, guard that's anywhere near them while they're off swimming in the Pacific. So on the one hand, I don't think it, I'm not opposed to the idea that there'd be good relationships. It's just like when you wrap your brain around the fact that there are American kids out there in, you know, who are dying that day while, you know, Kissinger and Debrinen are, you know, going to meet Frank Sinatra and Alfred Hitchcock. I mean, it's just like morally, it's just absolutely horrifying. Really so. incredible. Um, well, Carolyn, I know that, uh, that you've got to get going. Um, but I just want to say thanks again for, uh, for our conversation. Um, I really, uh, your story, the story you tell in your book, I think is, is one that I hope that uh, the next generation does pick up and, and read and learn a little bit about because I learned so much uh, and I was so grateful to be able to read your book. Um, Carolyn, what uh, what projects are you working on right now? Well, um, a project that you know I'm just a little helper on, but that I think is very exciting is that there is going to be on PBS in the American Experience uh, series um, a documentary. It's going to be called The Movement and the Mad Men. And that's going to be aired on PBS on Tuesday night, March 28th um, at nine o'clock. And then it'll be streaming for really a, at least another month free for people. So this is a documentary that's been worked on for years. It's about 90 minutes long. And a lot of the documentary focuses on the peace movement, especially in 1969 and the moratorium demonstrations which a lot of younger people have never heard of at all um but they have amazing footage have done amazing interviews and it's so it's partly about the peace movement it's also in, focused on how the peace movement especially the moratorium campaign actually directly affected richard nixon's strategy right there because he had planned to escalate on November 1st in some dramatic way. And this is one case where the protest had a really direct impact, which he had to cancel his plan to escalate. So the filmmakers have done an amazing job just in terms of like all the people they've consulted. I think they did, you know, maybe close to 20 interviews for the documentary, many of them people who worked on Kissinger's staff and 
Dan Ellsberg and a whole bunch of people. But it's a great documentary and people and it has a lot of educational use and and people should see it. So again, that's the movement in the Madman and PBS on March 28th at 9 p.m. And one of the interviews will be you, correct? On that, correct. I have no idea. I mean, everybody <laughs> that they interview, they talk to forever, um, yeah. and then they, I, you know, then they clip people. So you, sure. they might have interviewed you for an hour and taken one minute. Um, so I don't know who, you know, yeah. it's highlighted. I mean, I, I actually think the most interesting people they interviewed really uh, were the people that worked on Kissinger's NSC staff at the time, you know, who have Morton Halper and stands out in my mind. You know, these folks have a story to tell. It's pretty interesting. Wonderful. So Carolyn Woods, Eisenberg, uh, Fire and Rain, um, Nixon, Kissinger and the Wars in Southeast Asia. Uh, go buy it. Go check it out from the library. Um, a lot of really interesting things to uh, to be learned from it. And Carolyn, again, thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you for having me. You can see I still like talking about this. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, well, uh, well, I appreciate it. Uh, so thank you.